Hello, my name is Mark Martin and I'm an Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. This year I'm teaching a freshman writing seminar. This particular course focuses on teaching students important skills for college. That meaning close reading, the ability to present ideas both verbally and in writing, uh, group work, and similar sorts of tools that are vital for every incoming student. In order to keep student interests up, I decided to use a focus from my course, that is, symbioses and parasitism, and indeed one is a form of the other. The students seem to like the idea, which has things both weird and wonderful. As part of my class, I decided it would be interesting to have guest speakers. For logistical reasons, this is a challenge but I found that many folks were willing to uh, make a telepresence in, either by Skype or Google Hangouts, and it's been very, very fun. Our first speaker is Dr. Jack Gilbert, who is at the Argonne National Laboratories and the University of Chicago. And Dr. Gilbert has written several essays that the students were interested in, including the microbial aura, how the microbes that exist on our hands can actually invade our homes, and then when we move to a new home, they come with us. In addition, he has a long history of looking at the different ways that microbes interact with our everyday lives. In any event, I had students read several essays by Jack or about Jack. They formulated questions, I collated them, and sent them to Professor Gilbert. And I'm delighted to tell you that he read them over, he became a telepresence, a virtual chat, as it were, in our classroom one day, and was able to address many of those student questions. I hope you enjoy this experience as much as we did, and we're certainly very grateful to Professor Jack Gilbert. <laughs> ah, there's Jack. Can you hear me, bro? Can you hear me? Yes. I would like to welcome Dr. Jack Gilbert of Argonne National Laboratories and of the University of Chicago to my freshman writing class on symbioses and parasitism. I went ahead and I sent to Jack a concatenation of your questions and a piece of artwork, and Jack has offered to speak to all of you today. So, so you're not going to look at my face. I'm going to turn it around so he can look at you. Is that all right with you, Jack? <laughs> That's perfect. All right, here we go. Hello, class. <laughs> but, what's going on? Oh, we're not even All right. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we do now? It's whenever he talks. I am talking. Can you not hear me? If you. Um, technical, technical difficulties. Blah 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 blah. <laughs> That's fabulous. Yeah, oh. you can hear me now. Oh, there we go. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're presenting to everyone. That's grand. Um, okay, let me let's click on that one. All right, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, Jack, I sent you a series of questions that they wrote, and if yeah. you don't have them handy, I'll ask them to ask you themselves. Which do you prefer? Well, let's start. I've got them right here, um, but instead of me just talking, um, all right, let's start with the first one. So, Ellen, where's Ellen? I'm not, I'm not in the camera. Step over here, Alan. We want to see you. Where are you? I can't see you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I see only a small fraction of the class. There she is. <laughs> All right, uh, so do you want me to just answer your questions as we go through, and then we can interact verbally via that route? Uh, sure. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> All right, so it seems like the work you do involves an extremely large amount of data. How do you keep this data organized in a way that's both effective and understandable? Ha! <laughs> um, <laughs> badly, <laughs> most of the time. Yeah, you're right. Um, we have a large amount of data, 
but we also have a large amount of data types, and that's where it becomes very complicated. Um, you know, when we're dealing with patient records and molecular data on the bacteria and the fungi, uh, on you know the atmospheric pressure and the soil pH, or the or the uh, moisture in the indoor environment, or the temperature of the air, or the surface material. Um, all of these different measurements are often made by different people, and the data which comes out is rarely easily comparable between different di di kinds of data. So we struggle, and we're learning every day how to deal with these kinds of different data types. The, the Most of the data we've put together is handleable on hard drives that you know you and I would normally use, and we can share a lot of it online via downloading through FTP sites. But the data aspect is one of our, our biggest problems. But we can overcome it. It's not insurmountable with today's technology. It's more a case of just organizing the researchers and the people involved in these studies in a way that we can effectively share the data and effectively analyze that data. That's tricky to do, but um, it's more of a human human failure and a human problem than it is a technological issue. Um, people just don't work very well together often, so we have to work out new ways to make them work well together. Uh, does that effectively answer your question, or do you have another add-on to that? Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> I had a more general question. How do you get started in this field or area of research? Um, I, I'm a weird person to ask that from. I, I, I finished my degree in uh, 98 in, uh, in basically biology and zoology. Um, then I went to work at the Natural History Museum um, in London working on butterfly distribution patterns in Africa. Um, and from there, I was having lunch one day, and someone phoned me up and asked me if I wanted to go to Antarctica for 15 months because they needed someone to uh, be a PhD student on one of their programs. And I was like, yeah, you know, sure, I'm not doing very much. So I went down to Antarctica for a year and a half and, and learned how to do microbial ecology. And from there, I, I, that was working for a company as well. And from there, I, um, I went into biochemistry doing a postdoc in Canada. Um, had no idea what I was doing, but kind of just accepted that I could learn, and, um, and went from there. And then, and then from there, I went back to England um, and worked on microbial ecology for another five years before before coming over to Chicago. So I've really done quite a circuitous route, um, and I didn't really do a typical professional development. I had no plan at all. Um, I kind of just winged it the entire way throughout my whole career. <laughs> Uh, with no real um, no real understanding of how to take it forward in any any rudimentary fashion. So I would suggest uh, I'm not the best example to ask of how I got into this area. I, I the way I would answer that is just to say it's awesome and it's exciting and I really love it. So you know I'm doing something that I enjoy doing and that's the key aspect. All right, have you got any more questions, Ellen? No, that's all. Thank you. All right, cool. Where's Kate? <laughs> Forcing your way into the picture. Hi, Dave. Right, um, are there specific ways I can culture my microbiome by eating different foods? Um, I'll answer that question first. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, we've seen a massive reduction in the in the consumption of fermented foods over the last uh, hundred years or so. So before you know, before we had refrigerators and freezers. Um, we used to ferment foods a lot in order to preserve them, and that kind of fermentation process would yield an enormous amount of uh, different bacterial cultures, different bacterial organisms, and also different bacterial products, which would definitely have shaped our microbial community and our composition. And there are weird people around the world that are now consuming large quantities of fermented foods deliberately to try and re-establish their own microbial communities inside them in a way that maybe they, they had a hundred years ago. Um, we don't know if that's working effectively, there's too low a number of strange people, but we're trying to understand that in a more effective way. And we know there are foods that can specifically feed certain microbes. You know, I, I changed my diet to try and do that. I ate a lot more um, leafy greens which add bacteria into your diet and also provide uh, fiber to actually 
allow the proliferation of certain organisms in our gut, certain firmicutes, certain bacteroid ETs, certain gamma proteobacteria that can be effective in trying to reduce uh, inflammation inside your uh, intestinal tract. So we do have some evidence of that, but we're still working on really understanding the key organisms and key food relationships. Um, so some examples, I'll give you one, but I'm not sure I have many more. <laughs> we're trying to figure that out as we go. Um, I like your question about hair. Can the amount of hair significantly change the microbiome? I, we don't know. I, I, I love it. I love it. And, you know, maybe people should stop shaving. Um, maybe dogs' hair does create a biodiverse environment. I've got no idea. Um, I know my. I, I still have a beard. My wife makes me keep keeps it trimmed. Um, so I don't know. Maybe I should argue the fact that um, a beard does have a its own microbiome. Weirdly, there was a paper from the 1970s um, that my one of my lab managers has up in her office um, that talks about the beard bacteria um, and how bearded men are a hazard to laboratories because their beards contain so many bacteria. They're almost like a, a threat to um, to sterilization processes in labs. Um, and she reminds me of that regularly. So I have to keep my beard trimmed for multiple reasons. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it's a great, it's another ecosystem. Um, and yeah, we, maybe we should be understanding that. I like that question. The beer dome, oh. right, Jack? We What's that? The beer dome. The beer dome would be, uh, yeah, probably a bad reading, I remember reading, Jack, that somebody isolated a yeast from beard and made beer out of it, which <laughs> I'm not prepared for. Uh, it's not just from the people's beards. People have taken yeasts from other less or more nefarious places on human bodies and used yes. that. Uh, maybe, maybe you don't want to go there. <laughs> All right, um, Gabe, do you have any more questions? Uh, I don't think so. All right, I'm sorry I can't answer your questions about dog's hair, but I, we, we, we are trying to figure that out. That's a good idea. All right, Lizzie. Hey, Lizzie. <laughs> uh, have scientists tried to evaluate the radius or gradient and the microbial aura? So there's a group down in Oregon at the moment with Jessica Green, and they are literally trying to do that. They're placing not, it's, it's a very crude method, but they're placing different Petri dishes at different distances from a person doing certain tasks, like sitting at a desk and typing or, or writing in a book. Um, and that person has to remain still um, while doing activities, and they determine um, how many different types of microbes are shed at different distances from that person. But it's not a particularly effective way. Uh, the density of microbial organisms around us um, is probably highly dependent upon the number of cells we release. So on areas of open skin, like our arms, our hands, our faces, um, we're going to be releasing more microbes into the environment than potentially off our skin, right? But I just, we just don't know how to measure the density of the aura and how it changes. You know, when I'm being particularly, uh, when I'm gesticulating in a particularly um, avid European way, rah, 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 I'm probably shedding and increasing my microbial aura around me much more frequently. So it's going to vary depending upon what you do, but it may also be, um, you know, maybe, maybe very interesting to study how it's responding. Um, I always say the people in the front row of uh, any lecture I give probably get a good or a healthy dose or unhealthy dose of my oral microbiome because your oral microbiome is still being released by the droplets of moisture that come out of your mouth when you speak. You're protected by an interface, so don't get too freaked out. <laughs> um, but you know that that probably has a big implication in in the directionality of our of our microbial aura, and it's a, probably a key component. Um, and you asked about Ed Young's uh, article. Um, yeah, so, so suppression, right? Um, I don't know if there are any other particular processes. We know that certain kinds of human physiological conditions, so um, immunological suppression, uh, various aspects are going to alter the microbiome. Um, whether any of them are particularly leading to a suppressed microbiota, I'm not sure. I would suggest that alcohol um, and uh, lots of fizzy drinks, lots of acidic drinks, they are going to affect and alter the microbiome in a in a probably a negative way for a lot of those species. Um, I stopped drinking 
fizzy, carbonated, sugary, and, and, uh, and drinks with uh, sweet artificial sweeteners in them for that reason. I think they're, uh, they're probably a bad idea for your microbiome. And I was like a number one fan for Coke. Probably Coke's number one customer for a while, so I, um, I, uh, it, was, it was a hard thing to do. But I did it because I, I, I'm pretty sure they must be altering some things. We know that they alter the microbiome, but I'm not totally sure how much they suppress it. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, upset stomach and loss of appetite. You know, you do get an upset stomach after you've been drinking all night, and that's not a physiological response. It's a, a, a response of the microbiome. You've flushed out a lot of the bacteria in your gut, and they're no longer able to help you process the food in an effective way. So you get diarrhea, you get um, you know a, a bad upset stomach from drinking alcohol, and the same is true for an antibiotic. You know, antibiotic is a reduction. Uh, antibiotic in, it reduces the um, uh, well, it changes, sometimes reduces, sometimes increases the flow inside your intestine. So the, um, the uh, uh, what's it, transportation efficiency of food processing through the intestine. So it can also alter the, uh, the level of upset stomach you have. Loss of appetite, absolutely, but I, I, we don't know what, under, what affects that link. We know that bacteria influence appetite by changing hormone levels in your, in your liver. So they release metabolites into the bloodstream, which actually bind onto receptors in the liver and affect um, uh, hormones, which then reduce your appetite in your brain. They can also affect that by the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve goes in your stomach up to your brain. And localized inflammation in the gut, uh, which is an interaction between your immune system and the bacteria, um, can affect transmissions through the vagus nerve, which affects behavior in the brain. So we know that altering the bacteria can affect behavior and appetite. So if you do take an antibiotic and knock out certain organisms, it could definitely affect appetite, and that could be a root. We just don't have any specific evidence to support that hypothesis. Um, we are currently, your crime scene question, we're currently working with a group in Hawaii um, on a, uh, a study to look at the robustness, that word robustness, of, of bacterial signatures on, on corpses. Um, uh, so, um, can we look at the types of bacteria that we find on corpses? When somebody dies, does their microbiome stay stable and identifiable as theirs? Um, how long does that decay take after death? Um, do the types of bacteria that are left over from a physical interaction, so somebody strangling you or, or you know, physically interacting with you, can we identify their microbiological signature on, on dead or decaying tissue? That's something we're trying to figure out, but absolutely, in a few years, I think we might be getting to a stage where we can identify it in that way. Um, you, yeah, you have a lot of questions. So, even if two subjects never touch or consistently handle the same, yes. Currently in your classroom, none of those windows are open, right? One's open. Well, that's a good thing. <laughs> um, if that window is closed and the door is closed, then you would be increasing your microbial similarity between all the people in that room by about 0.0001% every hour. So you're sharing microbes now, and your proximity increases your sharing likelihood. So you don't have to physically interact with each other or the same surfaces purely by the types of bacteria you're releasing, you are sharing microbes. Um, this is where I get a little bit weird in the fact that I actually think or believe that the way in which um, social communities have evolved over the last you know, 100,000 years or so um, may be in part due to the types of bacteria they share. And so we may have evolved mechanisms to acquire microbes that we share with our companions, and this gets even weirder, uh, you have to excuse me, this is totally hypothetical, but if bacteria do affect behavior, we may, it may be evolutionarily advantageous for people within the same troop or, co or community or tribe to share more microbes, which would influence and increase their likelihood to feel um, empathetic or, or socially um, structured or cohesive within that group. So, you know, if you share more microbes, you're more likely to have a similar behavior response to certain stimuli. And if that's the case, then we may actively um, respond by increasing our sharing. Um, and so there may be behavioral reasons for that. You know, we might increase physical activity or communication 
or they're, they're also maybe um, immunological or uh, uh, responsible to that by increasing the number of microbes we share. I don't know, but that's something I'm looking into. So I think we have microbial propaganda taking place. <laughs> no, but... I've been accused of that many times, Jack, and I, and I think this is evidence, right? Here. You're the microbial propaganda king. <laughs> Um, <laughs> this is absolutely evidence that they may control our lives, or we may have evolved in a way in which uh, we uh, we're better together, and so we may have evolved uh, our social cohesive structures in order to improve microbial sharing. And maybe the breakdown in society is due to a decrease in our microbial sharing capacity via cleaning too much and being uh, too independent and uh, not, not having uh, that personal space issue. You know, Americans love their personal space, right? You know, don't, don't touch me, don't touch me. Um, maybe that's a bad thing. Maybe we need to be a lot more huggy and touchy like we are in Europe. Um, although, you know, Europe, we're fighting battles all the time and, uh, and we're not exactly in love with each other, so I don't know, maybe it's not a good idea. I don't know. <laughs> all right, um, any more questions, Amy? Okay. Um, Aiden. Hold on, Madison. Well, we're, we're, well, we're not too far away from dietary stuff. Um, hi, I'm Madison. Hi. <laughs> uh, I am wondering if there's a huge number of people who are going like off gluten right now, including a lot of members of my family. And I'm wondering, there's a lot of, I've seen a lot of articles, sort of pop science articles about the validity of gluten intolerance. Can you, can you uh, either come closer or repeat your yeah. question? I'm finding it hard to hear you. Hi. <laughs> um, there, I know a lot of people who are going off gluten, and I've seen a lot of like uh, questions about the validity of sort of gluten intolerance. And I wonder if you think that sort of that kind of drastic dietary change is more of a self-fulfilling prophecy, and that we lo lo lose uh, microbes that are able to help suggest that kind of food. Rather than actual physiological intolerance. Well, um, all everybody has a mild um, inflammatory response to gluten. Mm -hmm. um, it's you know it's it's a byproduct of the food we eat. It, it, the actual protein itself, when it interacts with the gastrointestinal lining in abiotic, so uh, germ-free mice or mice with a bacterial community, all mice, all mammals have an a response to it. Um, there's also, uh, you know, but the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of people, you would never notice that response. It's entirely and utterly uh, benign. Um, there's another element to this that there are there are compounds that come along with uh, gluten, which actually some people are more allergic to than they are to gluten. They they show an actual allergic response, but it comes along with gluten. Um, and so when they eat gluten-free food, foods, they still get a response. Um, because they haven't eradicated the thing they're allergic to, they just eradicated the gluten and not the uh, not the bad compounds. So I'm not a nutritionist, um, and I'm not a doctor in that respect. So I'm not entirely. I can't give you any particular advice, but um, I, if uh, people should eat what they want to eat, but uh, I don't necessarily think a gluten-free diet is useful for the vast majority of people out there. That being said, um, you don't need to eat wheat. Um, and uh, if you know if if you don't want to eat it, or you know you want to eat something that doesn't have that compound in there, there's no particular reason why that is a bad thing to do. Um, it just may be uh, it'll hit your wallet a bit more than it probably should do. Uh, they're expensive those foods. Yeah. Um, but also, um, it, how's it affecting the microbiome? We just don't know. I don't think that the microbiome is significantly influenced by the absence of gluten because there aren't many bacteria which can utilize it. It's, it's kind of a bit of a, a weird protein, you know, it's not, it's not particularly digestible. So um, I'm not, enough, not enough evidence has been done to uh, support that, but I'd be interested to see if it was true. Right, thank you. Shall I go back to Aiden? Yeah. Um, um, if hypothesis three in the hospital microbiome study was proven to be correct, do you think that there'd be an ideal microbiome, a microbiome that would be able to mesh with and even help other people? Yes. I also don't know. <laughs> my, my, my problem with that is the vast majority of bacteria, when they're released from our bodies into the, into the indoor environment, die. Um, and the ones that do subsist and do survive 
Um, we don't know how likely they are to have any particular influence upon our, our self or our body. Um, we're trying to figure that out, but that's absolutely something which could be the case. Now, what's an ideal microbiome? That may vary between people, it may vary between spaces, um, and we are so far away from trying to understand that in a really real terms. But um, I, I am interested in the idea of building probiotics. I am interested in the idea of, of different structural architectural responses to changing the microbiome in indoor environments. Um, and you know, it may be as simple as reducing or increasing the amount of physical microbiological interaction we have with spaces. We don't know though. But it, that's a good point, and I'm, I'm we're trying to figure it out. <laughs> Do you have any more questions, Aidan? No, that was, that, was, that was it. Thank you. Uh, Alice? Hi, Alice. <laughs> um, uh, a commonly studied biological context environment, what parallels, if any, um, can exist there? We, um, succession, that was me speed reading, sorry. <laughs> succession is a key aspect of all, micro, all, all biological systems. You're absolutely right. And we're utilizing ecological theory to better understand how microbes build up in an environment, how communities are assembled in an environment. Now, um, within a person, a uh, vast majority of microbial succession occurs with colonization very early in life, so within the first year of life. And that's your switch between, uh, you're born, if you're born, let's say, vaginally delivered, uh, you'll, you'll acquire your mother's vaginal microbiota, and then you'll acquire her breast milk microbiota because the mother actively recruits bacteria into the breast duct, which is then released with the milk. So you'll acquire microbes that way. And then through physical skin interaction, um, through picking up whatever you find on the floor and, and, and putting it in your mouth, or uh, being passed around between uncles and aunts and friends at parties, whatever, you'll, as a baby, you'll acquire a microbial signature from the myriad interactions you have with your environment. And some are... Uh, evolutionary uh, advantageous, some maybe not, but we are starting to understand that. But different environments respond differently to different successional strategies. So in, in the classroom you're in at the moment, um, the bacteria you're shedding, some are going to die, some are going to propagate, but the ones that will propagate will propagate because they're able to survive in that environment. So the ones that colonize you as a human being will only survive there if they can survive in that environment, so that was tautological. <laughs> but think about this, if you change your diet, and this obviously relates back to the question with regards to gluten, but if you change your diet, let's say you start eating a lot of hamburgers and hot dogs and you suddenly have a high fat, high protein diet, right? Say you suddenly change your diet and you're inside you, your ecosystem has suddenly changed dramatically. What does that mean? Well, that means that if a bacterium, if you interact with the environment and a bacterium you would normally interact with that would normally die because it's, it's adapted to a high-fat environment and can proliferate in a high-fat environment, if you suddenly don't have that high-fat environment or you suddenly do have that high-fat environment, then that will alter the survivability of that bacterium. So think about that. If you suddenly start eating a high-fat diet and a bacterium which loves a high-fat diet colonizes you, it won't die out, it will proliferate. And if it loves a high-fat diet, it may want to shape that ecosystem to improve the high-fatness of, of the environment. Um, and so it may alter your psychology or your behavior um, in, you know, not deliberately, but through its interactions with you as a host to increase the amount of uh, high-fat calories that you consume. So um, that would alter the successional dynamic of the, of the environment inside you. Uh, but we are, the reason myself as an ecologist is interested in the human microbiome and the built environment microbiome is because we're applying ecological theory to these new ecosystems. Um, you know, the, 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 I'm a marine microbiologist, what the hell am I working in human microbiome research for? Well, um, it's just another ecosystem. It's another ecosystem that's potentially interesting. It's also another ecosystem where they've got a lot of money dollars to spend on funding. Um, which is helpful. So we are trying to understand how to apply ecological theory to these new ecosystems, but actually it's not that difficult. Does that in part answer your question? Yeah, so I just one other like, quick question I guess I have is um, like with ecological um, succession there's often like it's pretty predictable to like what 
um, species will show up first in primary succession. And there's sort of like a known order of you know like what colonizes first. Is there um, certain species of bacteria that are pretty consistent in microbiomes or in some, like a certain order? So in, in we know that in the in the built environment where I've done the most of this research, yes, absolutely. We see a very stable successional characteristic for indoor environments. Um, all of the bacteria we see, most of them, well, 99% of them come from humans, uh, or for, they're human mediated, either brought into the environment by the humans, it, unless there's dogs or cats coming in as well. But essentially, the humans bring that microbiome into that environment, and that microbiome undergoes stable successional trajectories. Now, when we looked at homes, we saw that. Different homes had different microbiota depending on the family, but the types of microorganisms that were surviving in the environment were all quite similar. Propylene bacteria, um, 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 epi um, yeah, other organisms. <laughs> I need more tea. Um, but you know, we, 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 we can identify a particular successional trend. When we looked in bathrooms, we've seen that the same successional trend occurred no matter what bathroom we looked at. So that, in fact, all bathrooms are kind of the same in the same building, despite the fact that different populations were using them. So we, we know that happens. In human beings, we also know that the same successional trend occurs. But what we're starting to see, and this has relevance to that home aspect of different microbiota, is that while the same organisms, same types of organisms, colonize in a predictable fashion, the species vary. And this is the same as taking a, um, a sand dune successional trajectory. So if the sand dunes um, on the shores of Lake Michigan have the same kind of successional trajectory as you see on the sand dunes in the coasts of Australia, but the species of plants that do it are different. So it's exactly the same kind of idea as that, you know. But yes, absolutely, it's all predictable, and we, we can always get to a very similar endpoint. So, so Jack, I showed them the other day Rob Knight's beautiful three-dimensional trajectory of the gut microbiota of babies over 24 months. Yeah. And they, they asked many, many questions about what I can only call climax communities, and, 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 and that's exactly what you're talking about here. Exactly. These are all climax communities, but... How we define that climax community is difficult. Ecologically, it's the same community performing the same functional roles. But the human ecosystem is, is almost a microcosm of variability because we, we, it's, not like, it's not like we're all wildebeest sitting on the savanna eating grass, right? We don't have all the same diets. Even within that classroom, a lot of you will have very different diets. And each one of those diets will affect the types of microorganisms that can survive. So while holistically, that community may resemble an adult microbiome, which is basically what Rob's study was showing over that 24 months. It you know, goes from an oral, it goes from vaginal to oral, and then down into um, fecal, uh, looking more like an adult fecal microbiota. The types of organisms which are there, the organisms which have survived and proliferated, may be very different between two individuals. So we need to understand that um, on the basis of the uh, ecological theory of succession and the drivers, the environmental drivers which shape that successional trajectory. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Darby? Here she comes. Come on, Darby. Hey. The future holds for microbial research. What is going to be the next step for research? And if I told you that, I wouldn't know. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know. What we're working on at the moment is on many different forms. So everything from what we talked about before to you know, trying to understand how to shape environments in order to get to a predictable community structure. How do we change the architecture of our buildings to alter our microbiota? One of the things we're working on um, in order to help that along a bit is developing more sophisticated sensors to detect the types of microbes that are there, active and non-active, um, and how they change over time, which means you need them to be uh, very cheap, so you can deploy thousands of them in different ecosystems. They need to be very robust, so they can survive fluxes in temperature and moisture and various aspects. And they also need to be able to detect microbes automatically and send that information into our data hive, you know, the, uh, the cloud. And so we, 
we, once we have those sensors on site, we'll be in a better position to really help us to shape how the environment alters that microbiota and how we can alter the environment to better shape that microbiome. So from our research trajectory, that's where we're kind of heading. Better sensors so we can help change the ecosystem. Um, but you know, also right now we're very obsessed with diversity in species that are present. What we're really starting to focus on more and over the next 10 years this is going to become a key aspect is culturing and identifying the microbes and sequencing their genomes and then seeing how they metabolically interact with the environment. So you know, we know, you know if you take the cows and the sheep in the field we know what the cows metabolically do, we know what the sheep metabolically do, and we can predict how many cows there'll be if we change the amount of feed. Um, we don't know that with bacteria in most cases. So we're trying to go back to basics almost. We are getting their genomes, um, exposing them to different environments and looking at which genes are transcribed um, and which proteins become active. And using that information, we're now trying to reconstruct the ecology of those environments so we can better predict how those organisms will respond to a shift in, say, climate or a shift in um, the environment inside your classroom or a shift in diet. Um, and so those, that's a key trajectory, understanding the genes, annotating them to known functions and understanding how that organism as a whole responds and then how it responds in a community. Organisms. Um, again, basic ecology, but we we got a long way to go. It's it's a huge problem, and we're still trying to figure it out. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, Matt. Here. Here we go. Surnames. Sherman. Here we go. And there's Matt. Hey. How can microbes in the gut affect human behavior? Well, I kind of answered that a bit, but I like the one in mice. So we, there's a study recently um, where we took the, uh, we have a, a mouse model where we take a mouse and put it inside a box uh, where the only exit from that box is onto a high platform. The platform is about two meters off the ground and it's quite a narrow walkway. So like a catwalk um, in, a, in a model show, the mouse can come out of the box and if it's a brave mouse, it will walk along the platform and explore a bit. But a lot of the mice are anxious, or well, the mice, sorry, a lot of the mice are anxious, so they stay inside the box. Um, and these are genetically identical mice brought up in the same condition. So we're trying to figure out why you've got this dimorphism of behavioral response. You know, why some mice stayed inside the box, while other mice consistently went out along this high platform. Um, so we took the bacterial communities from the brave mice and transplanted them by making the uh, wiping out the, the microbiota of the other mouse and putting in the microbiota from the brave mouse. We put them into the anxious mouse. So swapped out the bacterial communities from the gut of the brave mouse into the anxious mouse. And that anxious mouse now becomes brave. It now walks out of the box and onto the platform. So why does that happen? And how does a behavioral trait such as well, bravery <laughs> or anxiety how is it affected by that microbiota? Um, well, we, we're still trying to figure that out. A lot of that could be due to the axial nerve relationship, you know, the inflammation in the gut causing messages to be sent to the brain, changing our behavior. A lot of it could be due to that hormonal relationship, the metabolites from the bacteria affecting hormones in the liver, which affects our behavior. Um, but it has big implications, whatever the answer may be, on things like depression and anxiety. You know, Billions and billions of dollars go missing every year in our economy because of um, uh, issues of depression and anxiety in our in our in our population. It's a massive crippling problem. You know, more people commit suicide than are, are murdered with guns every year. So you know, it, it's a huge issue. How can we control that? Drugs and and psychotherapy and psychological profiles don't appear to be having as big an influence as we'd hoped for. Um, maybe the link to emotional stability actually comes more in lines with our gut. You know, my mother always told me a way to my heart was through my gut, um, and she may have been right, but it's also maybe the way to my brain and my behavior as well. And we, you know, we know that you know, anxiety can be triggered by changes in diet, so maybe that's not just the amount of calories you're receiving, maybe it's a shift in the microbiome. And 
if we if we could understand and shape that shift in a better way, maybe we could have significant effects upon reducing uh, uh, obsession, depression, um, uh, anxiety within our population. Does that in, in some way affect your question? Yeah, that was actually really interesting. Oh, cool. Um, Jesse? Where is Jesse? Yeah, there she is. Um, are siblings or sets of twin microbiome the same? This is a really good question. Um, so genetically, the, the, the gene geneticists out there would love us to stipulate that, yeah, the microbiome is just shaped by your genome, but it's not the case. So monozygotic twins, so that's identical twins from the same egg, um, they are no more microbiologically similar than uh, dizygotic twins, uh, so si siblings, so twins set from the different egg, or even just normal siblings. Uh, so, you know, a brother and a sister of different ages, different sexes, growing up in the same household. Um, so there's, it, they, we know that they're growing up in the same household, they share that much microbial similarity, but they don't share any more than normal siblings. Well, why is that? Why does genetics not shape the microbiome? Again, it comes back to the same principle. You're born sterile. So if you're born with a microbiome that was shaped by the environment, that would be one thing, but you're not. You, you acquire vertically from your mother your, some of your microbes, but then the rest of those are acquired by your interaction with the environment. And no two people, identical or not, can ever have exactly the same interaction with the environment. I mean, they'd have to be, they'd have to be forced into that situation. You can imagine two people brought up in two identical rooms uh, with exactly the same interaction with, with the environment if they're, it, that they're interacting with. It's just not technically possible. There's too many permutations of interaction and behavior and lifestyle that can affect uh, the types of interactions you have. So there's no way that can ever happen. So you know, two identical twins are going to have different microbiota because they have different interactions with the world around them. Um, and that makes life a little bit easier for us to deal with. Does that answer your question? Do you have any more? Okay. Emma, love the painting. Where are you? Love that, love that picture. I'm going to tweet it. <laughs> um, and thank you for the, uh, the handshake. Yeah, that's great. Um, when a family enters a new home, does their microbial order entirely wipe out the established microbiome, or do you gain some of it? Um, again, a really good question, and we don't know the full answer to that. Um, what I want to do, um, and this will help answer it, is to take germ-free mice, so mice without any bacterial community whatsoever, and add them into a home um, in which there are a new family moving in. To put them in cages in that home or allow them to run around the home if we can do that. It's kind of difficult to release mice into people's houses. But if we could do that, then they would be almost like microbial canaries in a coal mine. You know, that kind of idea that you know, there'd be a sensor for us. They would acquire macros from that environment. And the rate of microbial acquisition would be determined by the, the diversity or the, propensity, the source of microbes in that space. So if, it, if, it, if the family that came into that space entirely eradicated the previous microbiota in that environment, then the only microbes that, mice, that mouse would acquire would be from the new family. Whereas if the old microbiome is somewhat present, then that mouse would also acquire bacteria from that old family. Um, we can look at the new family, but what we didn't see in the current in analysis of this data, we can reanalyze it, and there's ways to do that, and we're thinking about that, but in the current analysis, we couldn't see any of the microbes from the old family colonizing this new family. They just weren't there. But we needed to do the experiment in slightly different ways to be absolutely sure, and we did not do that. So it's something we want to do now, in the way I've explained, um, and hopefully we'll get a better answer. But unfortunately, I can't answer your question at the moment. Not properly. So, Jack, we have about six minutes left. Is there okay. one more question that really stuck out in your mind that you'd like to answer? I'm going to answer all the four remaining questions in under three minutes. So, Sanjay, uh, you know, Sanjay just shout. <laughs> Here we Can go. Can you microbiome assist others in fending off diseases? Yes. So in the case of um, C. difficile infections, we can take the microbiome from the colon of one person, transpose it into the sick person's colon, and stop them from getting a C. diff infection or significantly reduce the 
difficulty to clostridium difficile infection. Um, this has been proven to have an efficacy rate of 96.7%, um, and it stems from an ancient Chinese practice, which was called yellow soup, where they took the stool from a healthy person, put it into a soup, and fed that soup to a sick person, thereby making them better. Katie, what made you want to start this field of study? I really like it. They're called cool, awesome bacteria, and it's just fascinating how much we can manipulate it. Tiara Gill, I recently read your article called We Can Ill Afford to Live in a Post-Antibiotic World. Um, aptly named Superbug, states the main reason for these superbugs are developed due to some doctors over prescribing antibiotics. Well, antibiotic misuse, you should probably look towards um, agriculture. The, the 90, 80 percent of all antibiotics prescribed in the U.S. are prescribed to cattle and pigs and chickens in order to make them gain about 20 percent more body mass. Um, a lot of what we're going through now is probably due to um, such as autism, schizophrenia, obesity, maybe due to um, overprescription of antibiotics or inappropriate prescription. But there are situations when antibiotics are absolutely necessary where you would die if you don't take them. So we have to balance out the potential implications upon our physiological and neurological development with the necessity to take an antibiotic. But we really need to be careful. Imagine a future where I can prove that an antibiotic given to my child in the, um, in the first year of its life actually led to a neurological deficiency which caused it to have less productivity and become sociologically and uh, intellectually impaired. Could I go back and sue the doctor? And if I could sue that doctor uh, effectively because the antibiotic wasn't necessary and it was misdiagnosed, mis then um, uh, what would that mean to the medical profession? Um, would that mean that doctors would fear to subscribe antibiotics and could that lead to other problems? We just don't know. So we're trying to uh, walk a tightrope there. And one last question from Tori Butcher. Hey, that's you. Um, my question was how any person's gut microbiome affected by geological location. Great study from uh, Eric Alm and Lawrence David recently in genome biology. Uh, they did a, a year's worth of microbiome analysis, taking stools from every single day for a year from two people. One of them was Lawrence, one of them was Eric. When Lawrence went to Bangkok to live with his wife's family for, I think it was a month and a half, his microbiome fundamentally changed. A lot of the same bacteria that were there in his adult stable microbiome was still present, but a lot of new microbes, and about 8 9% of his microbiome was overtaken by new microbes. From the water he drank to the food he ate to the people he interacted with, with to the air that he breathed, they changed and added new microbes into his body. What was weird was that those microbes all but disappeared when he went back to America. So yes, anecdotally, geological location does shape the microbiome, but we don't know effectively what the key components are that shape it. Um, we're currently doing a study of urban versus country lit dwellers in, in Shanghai, and we show that um, whether they live in the urban environment or whether they live in the country doesn't seem to affect the microbiome, but it's very subtle in that kind of environment. We know that the microbiome of people that live in Venezuela and people that live in America is very different. They have very different lifestyles, so of course it is. So we're trying to figure out how the complexity of social interaction, lifestyle choice, and geological, like, geographic location, how that all shapes our uh, microbiome. We just, it's immensely complex. Well, that, cool. that, there are more there, questions that came out of that. So what I would like everyone to do in the last minute is thank Professor Gilbert for giving his talk to us today and answering questions. I'm certainly very grateful. So round of applause, please. Well, thank you for answering good questions, asking good questions. I more thank tea. you very, very much, Jack. No worries. Cheers. Talk to you soon. All right, thanks guys, thanks so much, take care everyone. Bye.